Gabriel Heater and his up-to-the-minute news of the world, presented by Forehand Toothpaste. Good evening, everyone. The last communique of World War II is in. Russia proclaims tomorrow as V.E. Day. The Russian people were told tonight for the first time of Germany's unconditional surrender. Moscow Radio reports all terms laid down by General Eisenhower were ratified tonight in Berlin. Field Marshal Keitel and Admiral Friedborg signing for Germany in the presence of Lieutenant General Karl Spatz, Air Chief Marshal Sir Arthur Tedder, Field Marshal Zukov, and General de Tassigny. There was some anxiety in many quarters today when ten hours went by without any proclamation in Moscow. Russia evidently waited for the official hour, one minute past six tonight, Eastern wartime. And Russia evidently waited for the ratification in Berlin for the crowning hour of German humiliation, unconditional surrender in the capital where the war was planned. And they evidently waited for the final death rattle in Dresden and Prague where the fighting came to an end but a few hours ago and surrender became official one hour ago. And now the guns are quiet everywhere in Europe and the lights are on and the hearts of men and women are lifted in thanksgiving as millions say tonight. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Peace in Europe. Peace in Europe. Hitler's war produced one photograph which belongs with those words, peace in Europe. A house in London had just been hit by a flying bomb. People were killed. Rescue work was going on. The picture shows a woman warden carrying out a child. The child crying, pressing its cheek on the woman's helmet, clasping her neck. There's fresh blood on the woman's hand. And the London newspaper which published that picture wrote these words. This picture tells us much. It tells us children were on the front line. It tells us it must never happen again. The guns are silent and the lights are on. And the people know the miracle has come to pass. Here's a forecast. My first after V.E. Day. Full victory over the Jap before President Truman is 62 years of age. He's 61 today. For the power now released for the grand assault on the Jap is staggering in weight beyond all human imagination. Hardly a man alive is able to compute all that crushing might. Never has any one nation ever had to face so great an avalanche in men, planes, ships, tanks, and guns. And all the weapons of war. And the wrath of an outraged people. One more year for the Jap may prove to be a long time. Am I over-optimistic? Only 16 weeks ago, the Nazi had 7 or 8 million men. Well-fed, well-armed, and well-entrenched. Von Rundstedt counterattacked in Belgium. And you and I heard people say we've lost a year, a year in supplies. A year of war. That was 16 weeks ago, and unconditional surrender was ratified tonight in Berlin. There will be dramatic surprise in Japan as well. And reunion. Reunion here at home before many people believe possible now. Here's a headline for which I've been campaigning. I and others. No more Nazi prisoners are to be brought here except any who are now en route. Good. Use every possible inch of shipping space to furlough or discharge every man we can spare. Here's an item for the Jap. Hitler's contribution to the defeat of Japan. 300 U-boats, all said to be in good shape. Nazi U-boats. Said to be equipped with the latest device for long journeys. They're being turned over tonight to the Allies in good shape. Here's an echo of a long, long nightmare. Benito Mussolini's widow is a prisoner in Allied hands tonight. Well, the brownout is lifted here at home. The lights show in the Capitol building on the dome. 
And Mr. Benson may have news tomorrow on the curfew, on the ban on horse racing, on gas and other matters. Meanwhile, Hitler's nose is rubbed good and hard in the mud of humiliation. Germany bans all Heil Hitler greetings, all Nazi salutes. And the number of German prisoners in American British hands runs into so many millions. It may be more than the combined total of all American and British troops on all European battlefronts. If any army has ever suffered greater humiliation, I am unable to recall it. Peace in Europe. There'll be hundreds of headlines now, all rich in human interest. Things have come to pass which few living men thought probable. General de Gaulle with a price on his head. Shoot this man on sight, said the French Quisling. Shoot this man on sight, said the Nazis. One man standing alone, calling to his countrymen to realize France had only lost the battle. Who would have said on that dark day when Hitler danced at Compiègne that de Gaulle would stand today in Notre Dame offering thanksgiving for the victory? that this one man standing alone would be the leader of his people in the great hour of victory. And the men who put a price on his head, fugitive or prisoner. Yes, headlines rich in human interest. Do you remember these words? 60,000 planes. 45,000 tanks. Eight million tons of shipping in a year, in our first year of war. Here are the results. 1942, 47,000 planes. 43, 85,000 planes. 44, 96,000 planes. In ships and tanks and guns, a free people made good its goal, fulfilled its promise to become the arsenal of democracy. A day may come when some men will say we need a strong man in America, as some men thought we did a few years ago. Remember those figures when it comes. This dedication of free men and women and free labor to the great task. Peace in Europe. Two million men will come home within a year and a shorter time, perhaps. More than a million have come back now, men who bled for this great day. Even now, before the war is over, one hears of veterans who can't find jobs. Even now, one hears of employers who say this, may, this man may prove to be a liability in time. I had better drop him now. We gave our pledge. All that we are, we said, all that we can ever hope to be for these men. It was a pledge sanctified with the youth and flower of a great people. It was a pledge we gave in the darkest hour our people have ever known. Let us honor it, and thereby honor ourselves and prove we were worthy of it. And that same pledge we gave, we said there will be no discrimination because of race, creed, or color. We said we fight for this, we fight to prove we can live without prejudice and discrimination. Every man who fails to honor that pledge is fighting Hitler's war, even now. News generally travels by wireless, printing press, and radio, but it, and it moves lightning fast, and its impact is powerful and violent. But an older medium carried today's news. There was no impact of violence. It was a church bell, and the news it brought reached into human hearts. I've heard people say we've always had war, and we shall always have more war, and there just isn't anything we can do about it. And today one saw the long lines of men and women filing into houses of worship for prayer and thanksgiving. And one realized again, nothing, nothing will ever lift human hearts as high as a bell tolling its message in one word, peace. One had to be there to see it all and feel it. One had to be near the mother who fell to her knees and raised the careworn face to God and loud enough for all who were near to hear every word. Heard her say, oh God, I've lost one boy. Bring my second back to me. Oh God, I need him so. Always have war because we've always had war. 
But people just naturally drift from war to peace and back to war again. No, I'll never believe it. Yes, say the people have never found a way to conquer war. Say the people blunder into war. Say the people are betrayed into war. Say the people want peace so much when it comes. We give ourselves up to it so completely we forget all the vigilance we need not to be robbed of it in time. Don't say we've always had war because people want war. I've seen people in every kind of human circumstance and experience. I've seen people rescued from fire and flood and death itself. I've seen a nation come out of all the desperation of hard times and feel the exaltation of a job and security and the dignity it brought. Nothing in all human experience has ever moved men and women as a bell tolling that one word, peace, as it did today, even when peace had come only on one battlefield. Even when millions knew it was peace only in Europe. Even as millions knew all the peril and grief waiting on other fields of battle. Even as millions knew peace in Europe was only a brief flash of light in a long night. People knew millions in Europe were homeless and faced famine and disease and all the plagues left by the horsemen of war. People knew the price it would take and toil and sweat before peace could mean anything, even in Europe. But the harvest of death was over on one battlefield and human hearts were on fire. How can anybody say the people have always had war and would always have it? If all the nations now in conference at San Francisco could feel the great upsurge which came out of human hearts today, this would be the war to conquer war. Wherever people met, someone would say, you know, it isn't like 1918 at all. People are quiet. They're solemn. They feel it all just as deeply, but there isn't any celebrating, no exaltation. And you'd hear somebody reply, it's good to know the dying in in Europe is over at least. But how are you going to celebrate when you know at this minute boys are dying on Okinawa? When you know the scourge of war will claim a frightful price before Japan is crushed? When you know how many who marched away to Europe are not coming back again? Our casualties, three quarters of a million. If all the men at San Francisco could hear the people speak, they would know they carry a mandate as solemn as any delivered to men who ever came together. A mandate born in the hearts of millions who are trying to say, this pearl of great price, it was almost ours a generation ago. This miracle called peace with the people fighting for it, praying for it. And willful men fought along party lines and fought each other over words, over words, little realizing they were winning empty victories to be paid for with the lives of our sons one generation later. In a tiny church in England, a man and his wife waited all night for the dawn's day. There were many other nights when they were in that same church, when the whole world waited for the Nazis to land in Britain. And the church bells were to warn everybody the Nazis had come. Night after night, this man and his wife came, prepared to sound their alarm. And by the grace of God, the Nazi never came. But now the bell was to peal joyous news, tidings of victory and peace. And the man turned to his wife and he said, I'll ring as I never rang before. With all my heart and all my strength until even our boy will hear it. Their boy would hear it. In the cemetery hilltop, which was now his home. Here where his youth and dreams and his love were all sacrificed. I'll ring, said his father, as I never rang before. You and I, we'll fight for the peace as we've never fought before. Until every man whose responsibility it is will know this is our mandate. This is keeping faith with those who kept faith with us. Good night. Thank you, Gabriel Heater. Gabriel Heater, with up-to-the-minute news of the world, was presented this evening by Four Hands Toothpaste, and he is heard Monday through Friday evenings at the same time, and Sunday evenings over most of these stations 
15 minutes earlier. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. <laughs>